Something about smoking is so retro. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going for, yeah. <laughs> You're a badass, man. Trying to develop a, a look and a brand. Adidas tracksuit <laughs> and a cigarette. <laughs> um, so how are you? I, I feel kind of bad that the last two conversations I started out with like 15 minute monologues about the state of Russia without asking you, how are you doing? Oh, that's okay. Uh, well, you know, the United States is continuing to veer wildly into an unknown future. Um, you know, we've had these, now it's the weather. We've had one big oh, snowstorm yeah. after another. It's snowing right now outside my window again. It feels like it's been snowing nonstop for weeks. Um, my, uh, you know, this, this affects my ability to play hockey, but the, the group of guys that I play with are total maniacs. So they, they have, they organize, uh, snow clearing squads that go out and clear part of the snow in the middle of the blizzard, then go out and clear it again with snow blowers and shovels and, and then they, they ice it over with water. I mean, it's really, it's really nuts. Americans are very entrepreneurial. <laughs> Russians in this situation will go like, all right, so I'm going to sleep now. Yeah. This is very pure because there's no money involved. It's just the joy of playing. The last game I played, it was a week ago, actually. I went up on a Friday afternoon and they had said the ice is pretty good and it wasn't good. It was, <laughs> it had a beautiful slick surface. There's kind of a metaphor here, but actually there were air pockets all over the place under that beautiful slick surface. So you'd be cruising along skating and all of a sudden one of your skates would, would shove through the surface of the ice into one of these air pockets and you'd go flying. And this happened to me a number of times. <laughs> so by the end of it, my, uh, yeah, my elbows and my hips, uh, we're, uh, we're pretty sore. Well, you're a badass too, then. <laughs> I'm a badass <laughs> for smoking a cigarette. You for actually like getting out there and doing things. You know, somebody, one, somebody in my hockey crew sent out an email. Um, I assume it was taken in Russia. It showed some big burly guy, uh, in hockey skates, but wearing only shorts. Like he was naked except for a pair of shorts and he's skating around on the ice with this kind of crazy look on his face and he's got a stick and a puck and he's skating around with puck all by himself on this big frozen lake. And then suddenly you see him skate up to this big hole in the ice and he jumps in, <laughs> jumps into the hole and he's, you know, bobbing around in the water for a second. Then he, he climbs out and he's still got this crazy look in his face and he grabs his stick and then he keeps skating around the pond. <laughs> we have these people that are called walruses, people who enjoy like swimming, getting into the water during the winter when you need to make like an ice hole. In St. Petersburg where, uh, you know, I used to live now outside the city, I lived not far from Neva, the big river. And uh, there was a spot, there's like this, uh, fortress that are a couple of is a couple of centuries old and there's one spot on the shore of the, like the fortress is right on the shore on an island and uh, in one spot there's a drawing of a walrus on the wall of the fortress and that's where these people would gather and it's always a surreal kind of look like I would walk around the fortress let's just take a walk and there's always like one old guy in his underwear just doing like some exercises like this <laughs> before going into water. And it's like often old people, like old men. Uh, with some body fat, right? With, yeah, a little bit of body fat, but, uh, you know, people in good shape. There's like a 70 year old person who's going to jump into ice cold water. And, uh, you know, I'm in my coat and everything and a hat and gloves just walking past just like okay you do your thing <laughs> oh well, we had we do have something like that it's probably imported from europe um called the polar bears club oh. it's people who jump in ice cold water in the middle of uh winter to demonstrate their hardiness i for years been 
thinking that at one point, at some point in my life, I want to do this thing. Um, January, I think the date maybe changes, maybe it doesn't, but like middle of January is uh, the Christian like holiday. I don't know the English word for it, but it's uh, the day when Jesus was baptized. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people go into the water. It's like a, a yearly th annual thing of like renewal. Uh, and, uh, you know, Jesus did not live in Russia. He was <laughs> baptized at that point of the, the ti at that time of the year, but it's warm there. And right. in Russia is this like snow. And so people make these ice holes and, you know, Putin does it and, and go into the ice hole. And sometimes the ice hole is in the form of a, a shape of a cross. And I remember, like, it's, you know, been a tradition all this time, but I remember seeing it with new eyes after I came back from America. Like, I I think I, I think it was not that I totally came back. I came back to Russia to renew my visa, my American visa, and it was in the middle of winter. And I lived in Houston in America, very warm. It, I, I hear that now Texas is actually... Uh, experience in a real winter and it's a, a problem it's really bad there it's 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 scary a lot of people not only lacking heat uh and electricity but also mm -hmm. lacking water so yeah it's bad yeah but at the time i was like this is not winter you guys don't know what winter is and then i came back to russia and these people it just seemed so surreal it's one of the virtues of going to other places of spending time in a different culture is when you go back to yours and you look at it as if it's not yours as if you know the the kind of filters that you usually have on your eyes that filter out the weirdness of your home uh culture yeah. kind of go away and i'm like walking past the lake and i see these people going into the ice hole because this is a christian <laughs> tradition i'm like what the fuck are you doing but i always wanted I always think that one day I'll get in shape and uh, I'll like prepare and be uh, accustomed to cold uh, at some point and I'll go jump into one of those ice holes just to participate in the, not so much the Christian thing for me, I have, you know, my own relationship with Christianity, but just the weirdness of the Russian culture that this is a thing that people do. And in the recent years, I don't know, let's say five years maybe a little more seven, it's become a little like a, like a trendy thing of sorts. And so you have this mixture of people who just like to jump into the ice hole, people who are actual Christians and for them, this is an important ritual that they do every year. And then mm -hmm. lately you've been seeing these like girls in swimsuit and you can see their hair has been done. Like you can do, you know, can't wear a fancy dress or something, but you can buy some bikini and you can do the hair and then do the ice hole thing and take a picture for your Instagram. And the the mixture of all of this, like how, like it's supposed to be a spiritual religious thing. And then it's so clearly for some of these people, a vain, uh, you know, trendy thing, a thing to post on social media. And I just like this, weird mix of stuff of of attitudes and and relationships that people have to this uh thing that they do that's a but lot never... of there's a lot of humanity packed into that i just i just have to tell you a, a quick story this is actually something that i mentioned in um in my book pay attention but just very briefly related to the experience you, your experience of coming back to russia after you'd been in the u.s for a while so in 1985, I think it was, I went down to Nicaragua. I spent a month living in a little town called Esteli. I wanted to see what the Nicaraguan revolution had accomplished. Huh. And, um, and it was also, I was supposed to learn Spanish. And, uh, but I, I lived with a Nicaraguan family and um, it was nine, nine people in a, in a house that was smaller than the one bedroom apartment that I live in now. Um, everybody, there were, 
I think the the husband and wife had their own bed, but you know, otherwise there were like two beds shared between seven children. Mm -hmm. And then I had my own cot, and you know there was an outhouse. Um, there was electricity and water, but for an hour every day, if they were lucky. Mm -hmm. It was extreme poverty. But the amazing thing was that um, I got used to it very quickly. I got habituated to it. And, you know, this was my life. And, um, and I also got used to hearing, you know, you'd hear gunshots and mortar shells going off at night. And then, then I go back to the United States after a month uh, of living like this. And I, I was living in Manhattan in Midtown in a, in a studio apartment. And, um, and it was as though I had never been in New York before. I was walking around Manhattan looking at the skyscrapers and just gawking and people were walking by me like men in nice suits and women dressed beautifully and in high heels and I was looking at them like what the fuck because the people that I was living with in Nicaragua um their clothing consisted literally of rags mm -hmm. like uh you know um old t-shirts with holes in them and, mm -hmm. and um so, but this is where I had lived, but it was, it was this really amazing lesson about the plasticity in, in, of the brain and how quickly we get used to things and then how quickly we get unused to things, right? Um, yeah. And maybe three or four days, I was just sort of a jaded Manhattanite again, but for that first couple of days it was incredible and i and the great thing was that i lived in a really shitty apartment you know the studio apartment um and you know i had a fold out bed and a kitchen that was basically like a closet uh but i i i went into my i, I took a hot shower um and you know they they didn't have hot showers down in nicaragua you could rinse yourself off with a hose that was it i took a hot shower and it was like I felt like a king, you know, <laughs> with this incredible luxury, a flush toilet. Oh my God, the wonder of a flush toilet. And then I got in my shitty fold out couch bed. And again, I, I felt like, like a king the, the, you know, my shitty cotton sheets were like the, like the most delicate silk because I'd been, I'd been, um, the, uh, the mat, the cot that I had was just, you know, this rough, uh, canvas and I had a crappy old blanket to put over me. So anyway, yeah. It reminds me of a, uh, a thing that, uh, Terrence McKenna said in one of his, uh, whatever you call his, uh, speech in speaking, uh, events where he said that you get we all are so accustomed to how much sexualization and uh, objectification there is in a culture that we don't notice it anymore. And he would go to the Amazon to, you know, hunt for those sacred drugs. And he said there it's not present. You know, you don't have these magazines and billboards and, uh, you know, ads coming at you at all times with uh, sex being a part of it, you know, in 90% of of the content and you get as you say unused to uh this presence of sex and in, in the popular culture and he said at one point they you know came to another village and i guess they went either to the shaman's hut or to like the uh one of the village's elders a hut and there was a calendar on the wall which was not like for us for somebody living in America, it's not, it wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary. It wouldn't, it's, it would not, it was not like overly sexual. It's just a pretty girl, maybe in a swimsuit or something. And he said, we stood there and we're supposed to be having a conversation with these village people. And I <laughs> couldn't take my eyes off the, of the calendar. I just was like enthralled by that one <laughs> picture. <laughs> and once you're back, it's not that picture is, is just very innocent and very just a calendar with a girl. But there he's like, I stood there and I, I, I was missing the words that the person was saying because there was a girl on the picture on the wall. That's that's a great story. I, you know, to me, what 
the significance of this is our habituation is one of the most powerful forces mm -hmm. in our lives. And, um, you know, we just get used to stuff and our brains are designed not to keep seeing stuff that's there all the time, but just to look for novel stimuli. So, you know, that might be uh, something that we can eat or that might be a threat or whatever, or something that we could have sex with. Um, and the result is that we just, we just don't see, we don't see the reality that we're in anymore. And I think this is one of the things that requires psychedelics and spiritual practices or reading crazy literature to right. sort of tear the veil away. And you're seeing what was there all along. This right. is, this is the mistake that a lot of people have about mysticism, I think, is that they think it's, you know, the, the bear, the veil tears, and then you're seeing something else. No, you're seeing what was there right in front of you all the time. You're just seeing it as if you're seeing it for the first time, which means that you're seeing it the way it really is. Right. You know, we should be in this state of gawking astonishment when we're looking at, you know, the, a calendar or looking at a skyscraper in New York or seeing these crazy Russians jumping in an ice hole in the middle of winter. Um, or these girls with their hair all done. Right, <laughs> that really, right. that really is weird. Uh, <laughs> we should see it. We should see it all the time. You know, I just, listen, we, we got to, I want to get to the ideas having their own existence, but if I may just finish this thought, uh, you know, I, I've just started teaching recently and I, I, to sort of give my students a dose of where I'm coming from, I have them read this column I wrote a couple of years ago called The Weirdness of Weirdness. How um, weirdness is a quality that we sometimes dismiss. It's something that's weird just because it's unfamiliar. And once you see it for a while, then it it's not weird anymore. Or once it might be inexplicable, then you explain it and it's not weird anymore. But what I argue in this column and you know the, you're certainly familiar with my views on this is that actually everything really is weird everything right. is infinitely improbable and that the most familiar things including our especially our own selves if we see them clearly are really fucking weird <laughs> like there's no way that we should be here and yet here we are and it's what's funny then i ask my students to react to this and, and um, you know, my, my favorite reaction, of course, they're trying to kiss the ass of the professor. Who knows what they really think? But, uh, but some of them are going, you know, I never really thought about how weird I am before, but now I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, my work is done here. <laughs> what age are the students? These are uh, the classes that I like best because they're sort of the freshest and the most innocent are freshmen. I teach two freshman classes, 48 students. Um, so that's what, 18? Yeah, 18, 18, 19. Kind of a troubling sign. If you're by the age of 18, you've never thought you're weird. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of weird. <laughs> well, some of these kids are very religious. Mm -hmm. uh, they've grown up in very conservative, um, families. And so, um, you know, maybe they've, they sort of been, they've, I'm sure everybody has these feelings, but some people just don't acknowledge them. They don't dwell on them or they suppress right. them. Right. And, and I think that again, is a, that again is a consequence of the culture that you're emerged in. The culture yeah. teaches you, habituates you to the weirdness and, and puts like these I, labels on it. This is, this is okay. This is how it works. This is, Here's a, what do you call it? A straight and narrow path. Here's yes. where you walk. Don't look outside. Yeah, don't look, because there's something really, really freaky right over here. Best not to pay attention right. to that. Um, I sort of see my job as a teacher as breaking through the habituation and get these students to be freaked out by the fact that they're alive. That's a good mission. <laughs> 
Um, so should we try to go into this uh, ideas thing? Yes. Bring Um, it on. yeah. So I've I've written this thing uh, recently published on at, at you know my newsletter psychopolitica dot com, uh, which I know that you've read it. I don't know what your thoughts on it are. Um, and it to me it started like I started writing it. It was really just an excuse for me to make this pun that I like uh, about political ideology. I always am frustrated with how. narrow the conversation about politics is and people's identification with you know there are like two sides and pick one of those uh or they try to make it a little more complex and instead of just the left and the right this really you know one dimensional um spectrum uh they they make it all right let's put add another dimension to it and there's like economy and politics and so you have these four quadrants and that to me doesn't seem like uh very complex either or not maybe complexity is not the right word just it still still continues to be limiting and so i a, a while ago i just uh came up with a spun that that seemed to me like a funny joke i i've run it by a few people and n nobody really reacted the way nobody thought it's as funny as i thought but um uh, i try to add another dimension to the two-dimensional play now the economy and politics just an unnamed arrow that leads you out of that little uh square of uh of uh you know the 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 the, the two the set of two dichotomies i guess uh and i called the arrow out and the idea was that you know people talk about the far left and the far right and what i want to be is far out there is like <laughs> out there and then the far out on this imaginary um uh, spectrum another dimension to the political thing so just just not to be confined by this uh very limited landscape and so i started writing that and then it uh morphed and changed and i ended up articulating i suppose something that uh i've been trying to articulate just for my own sake which is you know a set of my uh not assumptions but like evolving ideas about what i think about the world and how i relate to the political landscape to society at large to you ended up being in all over the place creativity and everything and what i ended up writing seemed to me like like you you had a a a bunch of conversations with different people with like things they pitch as a world view you know pan psychists who say that maybe consciousness is everywhere in every um every little piece of matter there is like some degree of consciousness or whatever quantum physicists you you've had a long list of these people and once i finished writing that thing that i wrote I thought this is a little bit like that like I have now a few you know ideas that taken together seem to constitute I don't know a premise for a world you not not really felt fully fleshed out thing but here's where I'm standing at right now and uh I don't know where it's going to take me so I'm really curious about your you know take on on that on on what you thought about the thing I wrote I guess I need to summarize it real quickly at the outset. The what are the elements of this thing? A uh something that I've internalized is not my idea but I think or at least I've um I've encountered it elsewhere. David Lynch and Terence McKenna are two people who've spoken about ideas that way uh and the notion is that ideas can be seen as living things like you can like Lynch is a proponent of transcendental meditation and McKenna obviously of psychedelics and they both just to explain I guess their thing like what their practice what they do they came up with uh metaphors and one metaphor that both of them used uh was ideas as fish there's this ocean of consciousness and you can go out there for Lynch it's like dive deep into the uh whatever the field of consciousness by using the meditation technique 
for McCann it's five grams of dried mushrooms in a dark room. And I think his metaphor was like you need to go out in the dark ocean of mind and then look for those ideas and look for fish that you can catch, that you can wrestle into your boat, bring back and make fish dinner for people at the, on the shore. Um, <laughs> but the idea of ideas as things that exist somewhere, that they're not just like you made something up in your mind, but they have an existence and you can, you know, interact with them somehow. Uh, for me, I, I'm not into fishing. Uh, so the fish metaphor never struck a chord with me. Really, I think about ideas as entities you can have form relationships with. You can engage like I'm talking with you. I can have an interaction with an idea. And so it's not catch and kill and make into a dinner it's more like something to play with or work with or uh, you know interact in some way and so with that as the premise I started out writing that Th that was really just a segue for me to start talking about again to an excuse to make that pun I was thinking about political ideology and I thought if I entertain this premise of ideas as living creatures then a political ideology is an ecology of ideas. There's, you know, a forest or a, a field or whatever. And then from there, as I started writing it out, um, I ended up with a few more elements. So the first one is ideas as living entities. The second as is humans are portals for these ideas. You know, they don't exist in this world unless somebody thinks about something, imagines something, articulates it, you know, if it's invention, you need to come up with it, then write it down, then actually build the thing. If it's a poem, you need to write it. If it's a, an idea to, I don't know, build a desk for yourself, then you need to build a desk. And then the third element is there are ideas of people. And the example I use is Putin, uh, you can use any other entity like that. It, th this is to point to this, you know, other dichotomy, uh, which is your immediate experience and your um, the world as it's been relayed to you. Like I've never met Putin. I've been living in this country for 32 years, give or take. There's a lot of talk about this guy. There's a lot of imagery. Um, I've never met him. I've never met anybody who met him. He might as well be a spirit, a demon, uh, uh, you know, some kind of... And Trump may, might be even more of a... Maybe may, may even a better example because he comes from the this world of representation, the reality TV thing, which never was real to begin with. Right. And so, so then... With these three elements together, I end up with this, like, I don't know, like a morphing change in hallucinatory kind of worldview where each of us is some kind of like a, a creature that has two parts to them. You have the actual human being and you have the ideas about that human being. And when we relate to one another when we engage uh, very rarely you can be you, you can confidently say I really know that person like I'm interacting with the person and not with my idea of the person even when you're when you know each other you're still projecting your own psychology onto them there is like you know enter Freud you know you're, you think you're in a relationship with a woman you're actually still having a relationship with your mother who neglected you when you were a child or something mm -hmm. and then and you know hopefully you have a few people that you can say you know and you actually interact with a person at least you know very close to uh being with with the actual person and then on the other end of the spectrum there are these entities like putin who shouldn't be like it's weird that I think about him as a person because I've never met him I've never had any kind of engagement with him that was real I am 
engage with other people who seem to be acting on his behalf. Like I go to a protest and there are these, I'm on this, right, police. And there's like one person beating another person. It's all about Putin. But again, Putin is not present there. And the, the right police person hasn't met Putin either. And so there's this entity that we call Putin, but it's not the guy. It's not the 67-year-old man from the Soviet Union who was a kid one time and who played hockey and who watched movies about spy spies and you know dreamed of being a spy and then a bunch of shit happened and he ended up on a on a throne and so all of these things like where does a person end and the idea of a person starts how these two parts relate to one another who's more in control uh, an example i i bring up in that uh, piece is there's it's a known fact that there are these photos that make it clear that Putin wears uh, shoes with hidden high heels because he's a short man and he wants to seem taller. And it's such an absurd, weird image through this uh, lens of the idea of a person and an actual person. Uh, the question is that I ask is, who made that decision? Was it Putin the man who decided I want to seem bigger and so I'm gonna walk in very uncomfortable I, I, I assume shoes and it's just a weird position to put yourself in um, for the sake of what cast in a bigger shadow or was it that shadow was it that idea of Putin who said I don't care what you think I need images where you look taller and uh, you know when you stand next to Trump you can't seem like a midget so put on these shoes and walk your walk. I, um, yeah. Can I, can I, let me just sort of riff on, on um, what you're saying. Uh, I, I thought you, your piece was uh, really provocative. It reminds me of some of the things that we've, we've talked about before. In a way, I'd say one of the questions you're raising is, what is the status of ideas? You know, we have our perceptions of the world and we come up with all these models and theories about the world. Um, and where are they? Are they just in our own heads? Um, and, you know, like represented by patterns in our brains, uh, which is what a, a hardcore materialist would say, which a lot of the time I am. I'm just a very conventional materialist. Or do they have maybe not all ideas, but some ideas, maybe endure, they go beyond us and they, they take on some kind of status, status that can't be um, traced to any individual anymore, to any individual brain. So there, there's some, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just trying to come up with, uh, with um, ideas uh, that, talk about the status of ideas mm -hmm. as something that transcends individuals and even transcends eras. So one popular example would be Jung's concept of the collective unconscious, which is, you know, sort of, I think of it as like uh, you and I both have our little tiny consciousnesses right here, but there's some kind of wormhole connecting us to this gigantic ocean of consciousness um, where all the ideas that have ever been thought um, are sort of pooled and uh, and then and we're you know we're influenced by that somehow all the people who are going to be born after us will be influenced by us um, somehow that Jung's idea of the collective unconscious made a lot more sense to me after I had this big drug trip 40 years ago mm -hmm. where I had all these like fantastic uh, hallucinations that I felt could not have come from my own brain. There's another idea you might have heard of. There's a, a kind of renegade British biologist named Rupert Sheldrake, yeah, uh, who came up with the idea of um, I think it's morphic fields or morphogenic fields or something like that. And again, it's the idea is that if if I have um, 
a brilliant idea. You have a brilliant idea. You have this idea about ideas that once you think that, um, that's somehow going out through the ethosphere and infiltrating other people's consciousness. And Sheldrake says that this, he, he thinks that this has even been observed among non-human animals. So there are some uh, monkeys on an island, a remote island off the coast of Japan that have learned some technique for uh, cleaning food by dunking it in water and getting the sand off it. And it's, it's a total novel idea for those monkeys. And then suddenly monkeys start doing it all over the place because it's spread through this morphic field. Um, I think this is connected to what you said early in the conversation that habituation is this force uh, that, that is ever present in our lives. I think his idea was that, or one rendition of the idea is that once something happens, it's easier f for it to happen again. Yeah. And so once an action has been made, it is more likely to be repeated than for a, a completely novel action to uh, to come out of, you know, of, of uh, our interactions. And the same thing about ideas and everything else. So it's like once something happens, you're likely to see it again. I mean, there are sort of conventional scientific versions of this idea of a, of a collective um, pool of ideas. I mean, our, our genomes have encoded in them a lot of the things that have been learned by our ancestors over very long periods of time. And some, some of our um, predispositions come from that as opposed to just nurture. Uh, and education and training. I think of Platonism, you know, the old idea of Platonism as being something kind of like what you're talking about. So Plato is saying that, you know, there's this world of forms, which is, you know, ideas mm -hmm. that uh, transcends us and that sometimes we can access through whatever, I don't know, using logic and reason, and reason but also maybe through spiritual practices. Um, I, one thing that has that has often struck me is just the power of ideas. So you know, everybody disparages social science. It's an oxymoron. Um, you know, it, it's too hard to really have a science of what humans do. You can make some sort of general observations, but they always fall, fall apart over time. But you look at somebody like Marx, and he had this set of ideas about what humans are and how they behave and sort of some moral principles um, that went along with his observations about human behavior, especially economic behavior. And those ideas became one of the most powerful forces in human history. And what's fascinating is that whether or not the ideas are correct, right. they, they take on this enormous power. Same thing with any religion. Like, look at the... You know, they, Jesus had a you know this collection of memes about being kind to one another and all that, and it, and it changed the course of history dramatically. These ideas that again transcended any uh, any individuals. So I I feel like you're sort of making observations about this whole territory of ideas as something that, of course, they originate with us, but then they they leave us. They go out there. And, and you're asking these questions about where they exist and, right. um, and how we interact with them uh, afterwards and whether they do have some kind of autonomous existence. I mean, I, I, you know, I had my first ayahuasca experience. I, I sort of experienced the, um, the mischievous machine elves that Terrence McKenna had talked about. And, um, they were like uh, embodied ideas that mm -hmm. were that had personalities and were talking. And I felt like they were outside of me and kind of looking at me and jeering at me. Um, so I sort of get, and I'm sure I, I assume that some of your thinking about this is inspired by psychedelic experiences where your ideas become sort of reified apart from you. DMT especially, there is this, uh, you know, ongoing conversation about the status of those things that you meet 
when you smoke DMT or you take ayahuasca, people encounter entities and then it's like, what was that? Who were these creatures? And I'm not, so none of this is like my, like what I believe, right? This is more, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by the questions and I'm looking for metaphors to even phrase the questions. And so when I think about this premise of ideas as something that's alive, uh, I can't help but go to the DMT trips and the uh, entities that I've met there because that's the closest in my actual experience that I can get to, you know, what an idea would be like if you met it face to face. Because normally we, there is no way to perceive an idea unless you, like you have something, like if you're writing, let's say, you have a thought and it's, it, you can, you can, you know, use your inner voice to formulate it. And then it becomes something that you can write down. And then once you've written it down, it's something that you can now think about and interact with. But before you put words on the thing, it was already in your mind, but it was not something you can really perceive in any way. So when we interact with these ideas that we project into the world that we manifest in the world. We never really interact with the idea. We interact with our own uh, articulation of the idea or representation of that idea. So it's, it's a very puzzling thing to try to imagine what an idea would be like if you actually could be held it um, or behold it. And, uh, and the DMT creatures enter the picture very easily because those things you look at and you're, they, they behave like an idea would. They change and they morph and from one thing there can be, you know, they kind of give birth to more of themselves. They're fractal moving things. Um, and uh, and so I, I go there just because I don't have other experiences that would uh, allow me to get closer to the idea of ideas as an entity that's alive. Let me make another observation that it, um, occurs to me as, as you're uh, talking about this. So there, there's this great a pioneer of artificial intelligence named Marvin Minsky, and he wrote this amazing book called Societies of Mind. It's kind of this free-form scientific prose poem with all these little mini essays in it. But the theme of it is that our, you know, we have a sense of our minds as unified, but actually it's this giant uh, society, a cluster of these little competing mini-selves that have different um, agendas, and that somehow there's some kind of meta-program that gives us the illusion of unification and having a single self. But often a lot of people, like schizophrenics, one of those modules becomes sort of separate from your unification program and you experience it as a different self within you yelling at you and and hostile to you and sort of racing off in all sorts of directions that you can't control or you have many of these selves i think dmt there's something similar going on these experiences when our selves are fractured um we might be seeing through this program of unification to something real to ourselves as as this multiplicity of cells right right uh which you could say is you know i'm using the word programs ideas would be another way of of putting it that are all sort of jostling and competing uh for attention in in our own brains this is a way of sort of possibly rooting it still in some kind of conventional psycho psychology and uh, and materialism, um, you know, because Marvin Minsky, he was a very far out thinker, but still Societies of Mind was, was drawing on findings in neuroscience and cognitive mm -hmm. science and so on. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. There, there are ways to, there are lots of different ways to, I think, try to look at what you're, what you're talking about. When you were talking about like ideas that transcend the individual, uh, I was thinking about 
what you're bringing up now, which is the individual might itself be just an idea. And there are, you know, different ways to approach it from what you've said to, uh, you know, in Buddhism, they try to, they use meditation to look at it closely and examine and, and to try to find what is that thing that we call the self. And they say, it's not there. You look and you look and you look and it's not there. Um, and <laughs> there is a, you know, DMT makes a bunch of different things uh, uh, seem differently than than prior to the experience one of them for me was all the myth myths uh, of you know ancient religions like uh, you take ancient greece let's say and i've always thought of those as stories that you know reflect some truth or some idea some uh, it's a metaphor for something you can uh, see some deep truth in it uh, or you can not see it there but i've never thought of them as an account of something that is actually happening. There's a minotaur and there's a guy with a sword uh, approaching the minotaur in the maze. And um, after, uh, you know, one of those trips, and it was not directly connected, but I saw, have you ever seen the statues, the ancient Greek statues colorized based on the remnants of paint on those statues? Yeah. They look really, really trippy. Yeah, uh, some of them. And there's one in particular that every time that I uh, look at this uh, rendition of what it supposed, you know, what it was, um, so claims the, the scientists that try to recreate the thing, uh, we, we habituate it again to think about them as these like white marble things. And they were colored in green and yellow and these bright colors. And there's one statue of an archer that's colored in such bright, you know, psychedelic, you could say, colors. Uh, and the, the palette is like a DMT, like reminiscent of the DMT experience. Um, and I've seen in those trips, I've seen these like multiplicity of characters interacting, going about, you know, their business and you're a part of that business that for periods of time, sometimes I'm able to entertain the notion that maybe the guy with a sword approaching the Minotaur is in the maze is what's actually happening. Like that story exists, like that story describes something that is happening, is as real as my experience. And I'm just a different story. And if you look at them, uh, you know, you write down my life and you put print that in, in the book. And then next to that, you have a book of uh, Greek myths. One of those stories, it could be, you, you could try to see the situation uh, such that uh, these ancient stories are more real because, uh, you know, it, a reasonable, rational way to approach this is to say that these stories are archetypal enter Jung with the archetypes, uh, meaning they're a meta story. They reflect the truth about a lot of stories that have happened throughout the history. Uh, you know, the, there have been a million of different people on some kind of a heroic journey in their actual lives. And then out of those condensed, you can have a story about the hero that encompasses all of that. But the psychedelic trips, I assume some other types of experience, maybe with meditation, whatever, can get you to a place where you can uh, consider the possibility that my lived experience has the same ontological status as those stories, that there might be a kind of self that exists, that experiences fear and courage and uh, thrill and uh, whatever else is a part of that story just like I'm experiencing what's happening to me. So this is a question raised by dreams also. Mm -hmm. What is, I mean, I, for some reason, I've been having a lot of, uh, I, I think I always dream, but I go through periods when I notice my dreams more or I wake up and uh, it's jarring to wake up because my dream was so vivid 
and this world seems kind of flimsy and unreal in comparison to the world that I was just in, where maybe my emotions were much stronger. Uh, I, I might have said this in one of our previous conversations. I, I think I've talked about James Joyce's uh, great work, mm -hmm. Finnegan's Wake, which doesn't make any sense, but, but the metaphysics of Phys Finnegan's Wake is really interesting. And at least the metaphysics that I thought uh, Joyce was conveying in the book, because who knows what the hell he was really talking about. But um, to me, it's, you know, the book is described as a dream, mm -hmm. is often described by critics as a dream. And, you know, it's, you're, J, uh, Joyce is taking you deep into the, the dream world of this guy. And, um, and normally we think about dreams as sort of metaphysically, there's the dream world, but there's, they emerge, dreams emerge, fantasies, myths, and everything from a reality. You know, there, here's the, the substrate of reality down at some point. You dive down through myth and dream and uh, fantasy and hallucinations and everything. Sooner or later, you hit the bedrock of reality. So Finnegan's Wake is this profoundly disorienting work because all there are are dreams. That there are dreams where you wake up and you're just in another dream. Mm -hmm. and it's, then you wake up from that and you're in another dream. There is no reality that you ever wake up to. Um, I've had, I once had a dream in which I woke up like five or six times in a row <laughs> and the same thing had happen, kept happening on each level, which was my father who's dead was chasing me with an ax. And that was, <laughs> that was a very tiring experience where you're like, finally this nightmare is over and then you hear the footsteps <laughs> and it's, it's your dead father with an ax. Was that, was there any reality to that? Was he a friend? No, 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 no. Very kind person. I, oh, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the dream was, how to interpret it. I don't know. Maybe me uh, uh, being afraid of the fact that he died or of, of death itself. I never really tried to analyze it. Right. But but the the waking up and feeling like okay finally the dream is over and i'm in reality where there's density to the objects and i, I feel grounded and rooted and then you find out this is not real anymore yeah, or once again it's not real i recently had a dream in which i realized it's a dream there was like some kind of adventure action action movie type scenario i was in some catacombs running with people uh there were these like military looking uh people around me and in the middle of that i realized i'm in a dream and so none of this matters and i shouldn't be uh, so bought into their narrative and i looked in the eyes of one of these military looking people and i told him this is all a dream you're you're an imagination of of myself and he stared back kind of like shrugging it's like yeah maybe so what <laughs> what are you gonna do now and and uh i don't remember much of the rest of the dream but i remember at that moment thinking this might be a long one this might be a i'm, I'm gonna get tired of knowing this is a dream and yet having to go through whatever adventures these people are involved in because i'm still in the catacombs and there are still people with guns running around and even if I know it's a dream, it's not going to be easy to just disengage and think, contemplate the nature of the dream world when there are, you know, gunshots around. I I think this is sort of the lesson of the uh, of the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the great Hindu text that you you should, you know, that wisdom enlightenment uh, helps you see that this is a dream. That this is uh, that that we live in this world of illusion. Our, ourselves are illusion. Other people are illusions. Um, all the things that sort of matter to us in the world uh, that motivate us, they're illusion. Uh, but then you you have that realization. But then you continue to live in the world as though it's real. So it's weird that it doesn't necessarily 
have any kind of moral or behavioral consequences, uh, enlightenment, um, you know, so you still are going to be a, a father or a mother or a warrior or a lawyer or whatever. Um, it's the same idea that's, I think, in, uh, embodied by the old Zen um, um, aphorism, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Um, I'm, I'm doing still quite a bit of chopping world. wood these days. Pardon me? I'm, I'm doing quite a bit of chopping wood these days. It's, it's becoming like a, a, a metaphor as well for all kinds of things. Once you once you like find yourself doing something repetitively, uh, you find additional meaning in it, or you, or at least that's my tendency. So chopping wood has, is becoming this like important part of my life, and my maybe will make it into a overall philosophy of what's going on. Yeah, but you're not carrying water. You have water, running water in your home. I do, though sometimes it gets a little sketchy. Like right now, it's cold, and we sometimes uh, the pipes for some reason the pipe with hot water freezes. Uh, but now I've learned a, a little life hack to turn. So this happens at night when the temperature goes, you know, even uh, lower than uh, during the day. And so now I, before going to sleep, I open the hot water tap just a little bit to not let the pipe froze. Right. That's what uh, they needed to do that in Texas, but they didn't. <laughs> We've been talking for an hour. You need to go now, right? Yeah, I've got to go talk to uh, some of the students at the at the school paper. But okay, okay. anyway, I have a bunch of other things to throw. It feels like we only started. Like we we're getting through the introduction to the conversation more than uh, more than uh, you know co having covered uh, a significant portion of the ground. It's a very deep idea. I you know I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, about it more. What, you know, what are ideas and where are ideas? Um, that's, that's, uh, that can take you in all sorts of different directions. So maybe in two weeks? In two weeks. Yeah, I'm sure it will take us in too many different directions. Okay, I'll let you go. Uh, and then we'll talk in two weeks. All right. Be well, Nikita. You too.